intrinsically like scratching. Some horses don't. Some don't like it at all, or, or it's neutral at best, at best for that. So I, we can teach those things, though, to become conditioned reinforcers. So, and think about the clicker. The clicker, when it starts, is nothing to them. In fact, for some horses, I think it's a little aversive. It can be a little startling and scary. So we end up conditioning it. We click, we feed, we click, we feed, we click, we feed, we click, we feed, until the click all by itself, they're like, the click. You know, and now what's happening when, and we're pairing the classic conditioning with this neutral stimulus until we give it value. And the value it absorbs, and the value that it becomes related to is, is the food. So pretty soon what happens with classic conditioning, we do have the, the physical response of the food. It is a visceral response to the food. So now when they hear click, they, everything that the food represents becomes happening in their body. So they, the drooling, the, you know, the, that eagerness, that endorphins, the dopamines, the, you know, all the things that are part of it become happening with the click. So the click becomes a conditioned reinforcer. Now, it won't maintain that frequency without a very high rate of reinforcement behind it. So what we can also do is then establish, systematically and thoughtfully, establish things as conditioned reinforcers. So the thing about tactile in horses, some horses love tactile. You know, they love being rubbed, they love being scratched. And, and some really don't. And then, so what we can do, or some like it certain times a year, you know, spring and fall, they're itchy, they're shuddy, they're changing then what we can do is actually pair it like we do with a clicker. So a lot of times I go click, scratch, feed, click, scratch, feed, click, scratch, feed, click, scratch. So now you've got the conditioned reinforcer on the, on the front side and the pairing of the, the, the food on the back side. So now you have it kind of sandwiched for two, between two reinforcers. So now we can actually systematically, and it takes some repetition until it becomes a conditioned reinforcer. You know, so it is, but it's just like the clicker. The clicker, you know, with I, eight or nine sessions typically is over doing the clicker, but that's what I recommend to people in the beginning, to do eight or nine sessions so that we know it's solid because if we haven't properly conditioned the clicker, what are we feeding? You know what I mean? We think we're communicating it was this, but if your clicker isn't a conditioned reinforcement, it's just some ambient noise, it's not actually serving the same purpose. So we may be reinforcing the wrong thing. So, the, so conditioning the clicker is really important. But really, eight or nine repetitions of the clicker is usually pretty good to establish it as getting the beginning of it working. But keep in mind, we then are also keep using it and strengthening it, strengthening it, strengthening it. So it, it's ready to kind of go typically. And, and, they're, and like I said, it's typically overdoing it, but they're, t they're ready to go and, and typically, you'll start to see it, we could see it yesterday. Like Joy, a couple times with the click, you could see her kind of, her ear, her eye, she's like, that sound means the other is coming. So that's starting to tell us, this has become a significant stimulus to her. So what we want to do is, and, but, and, and it continues to get stronger, so we don't kind of quit right there. So with the conditioned reinforcers, I, I want to kind of go to the heavy side, be heavy-handed with the pairing it, pairing it, pairing it, so I know that it holds that proper value. So I may do this for quite a bit, where I click, give a little scratch, then feed. Click, give a little scratch, then feed. Until pretty soon, it's going to be a conditioned reinforcer as the others. So we, so utilizing that. Now there's a number of things we can do. Remember I talked about the target and the power that the target absorbs pretty soon. The target itself can take them from an emotion, one emotional state over threshold worried to below threshold and focused and calm. At that point, we know the target. And when I looked back and I was like, why is it the target's not magic? It's not the target, what is happening? And, and realizing, so then it, it set me on this journey of what is it? Why is this happening? And I realized it's the classic conditioning that's already, I mean, we're training the, the target in an operant way. We're saying touch the target, operant behavior. You do, I click, you get fed. I, but after a bit, we've done it enough that it becomes a conditioned reinforcer. It has that classic conditioning, like I said, it never stops. It's always going on behind operant conditioning. So using operant conditioning can turn into the condition or a classically conditioned stimulus. So that's what really is, this is that odd power behind the target that I'd be like, I don't know why it does this. 
It's because it's changing things inside. It's in, in the brain, viscerally, inside. It is changing. And so the feelings that the classic conditioning with the target brings out can take them from, uh, to, and, and you know, it's not 100%, but a lot of times they, they can go, ah, oh, oh, the target, and they can settle down. It changes something inside. It's not just touching the target that did it. It was what, where it helped them to be able to come under threshold. So the target becomes a conditioned reinforcer, but you know what? Any behavior that is strengthened that strong they also become conditioned reinforcers. That's a goal that I want, is for the behaviors we work at to get such a strong association, <coughs> such a strong reinforcement history, that they they love those behaviors. They don't, they don't feel like you owe me for that behavior. It's like, I love doing Canada Park. It makes me feel good. It's endorphins and dopamines, you know, all the things that have been part of the training, which really, when we've done it enough, it's been part of the food. So these behaviors to them, indicate an opportunity for reinforcement which starts the the um, mental you know and emotional state behind it so we with the marine mammals particularly with the sea lions in our sea lion otter shows back then we had between otters walruses and sea lions we had up to 150 behaviors it's a lot it's, i mean and there'd be little things like sitting on your podium getting in the water do this do that this chain of behaviors do this up down handstand over drag me out you know and there was just many, 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 many behaviors. Ignore the fish, get the bit, you know, and it was, it went on and on and on and on. Well, we can't feed 150 times. I mean, we would, they would just all be obese, you know, and unhealthy. So what we did, we used a ton of secondary reinforcers. So they would do something right. We would bridge them, because remember our bridge signal, we didn't use clickers, but we would bridge them, say, good job, and then we'd offer secondary reinforcers. So a lot of times we'd lay them down and we'd scratch on them. Now, even though they, they like it, we still backed it up with food to strengthen it to be sure that it was a conditioned reinforcer. Another thing they liked was going in the water, so we put them in the water. Another thing they liked was sitting on their podium became such, a podium would be like a stool kind of like this, but they just sit on it. They're very, very heavy because you're putting big animals on them. And they would just sit there. Well, they sat there so all, I mean, that was a behavior that was so reinforced that that itself was a conditioned reinforcers. And these behaviors they've done over and over again were conditioned reinforcers. So we use conditioned reinforcers in that environment. But what here is my cautionary tale is the conditioned reinforcers I will use, so I will use food for anything that is new. So we're learning this new behavior. We're still shaping the behavior, we're raising the criteria, we're doing the behavior in a new place or a new, a new context. So context shift can have them lose criteria when something happened within that context. So when we can take them, so if I take, you know, we've done it in here and it's great and it, it's super solid, but then I go ask them for it, you know, in another pen or another place, I'm going to realize with this context shift, we're now, it may be more challenging to do. So I'm going to utilize food in all of those situations. So there, as we get more advanced, and this is important for under saddle stuff, because as you think about doing, riding a horse, you know, or doing a test or, you know, and judgment is a horse that John and Beasy had, and judgment, um, he had an open water issue, it was resolved with the positive reinforcement. And then at some point, the, um, you know, they had to build up because they knew they're going to a show with open water. They can't stop and feed right then and there, but they build it up over a year, you know? So it wasn't some drop in the bucket, oh, we did it a couple times. They, they made sure it was solid and good. But when she was in the ring, she needed a way to say, that was good, but we're not stopping. You know, so that was good, carry on, that was good. So by building up a jumping as a conditioned reinforcer from the tiniest little things, you now have him when he's good. He goes, oh, that was great. And then you say, now we're going to get to go do a jump. <laughs> you know. And so they only clicked on the open water because you don't want a bunch of errant clicks happening, but they, they conditioned the other behavior so they could follow through. So then it's like getting a paycheck. You said you did that well, you did that well, you're getting paid a little bit. You know, we don't get paid every single day, every single second. We know we're getting it. He knew he got it. So, so by building up to that and, and you following a bridge signal with a, a secondary reinforcer is a really important thing to get to. 
but it's also kind of an advanced thing. I want an advanced learner, and they're going to be advanced because if you've really conditioned a reinforcer, you've done a fair share of stuff, you know. And I also think it's it's for behaviors that are really, really solid, you know. So again, not a new behavior. This is a behavior that is really solid, and you want to be able to build up to. Does that make sense to everybody? Because